Alpha 7, this is Bravo Niner. Salute report. Bravo Niner, go ahead. Sierra, one male white. Alpha, running away, looking derpy. Lima, west side of creek. Uniform, Woodland BDU, Neon Blue Hoodie, Echo, None. Copy, Bravo Niner. Keep eyes on target. Subject is dangerous to himself. Our intrepid fugitive has probably been influenced by Hollywood. He thinks he can hide from thermals down in the creek bed. Let's see how it works out for him. Wait, I remember that movie. Didn't Arnold Schwarzenegger hide from the alien thing? In my last video, I explained the basic concepts of hiding your thermal signature. The human body is always giving off thermal radiation in the form of long wave infrared light. So somehow you've got to place a barrier opaque to long wave infrared between you and the sensor and have enough gap or insulation between you and the barrier so that your body doesn't heat up the temperature of the outer layer. Now we turn our attention to ways of minimizing our chances of detection and positive ID by a thermal operator. Thermal camouflage seems to be either too gimmicky and ridiculous, or overly technological and experimental, like this graphene Tetris jacket, or it's ludicrously expensive and inaccessible to civilians, like they'll only sell to militaries and police and stuff. But I'm wondering, can a trip to Dollar General help me reduce my thermal signature in any meaningful way? In this video, I'm going to test some of the internet's most popular suggestions, like just use an umbrella, bro, or Use spray glue to tack leaves and such onto a tarp. But before I show you what I actually cobbled together, and I do mean cobbled, let's talk about some evaluation criteria. How am I going to figure out if this is actually useful or not? The first figure of merit to consider is the ease of use. Is it cumbersome? Is it easy to don and duff? Does it interfere with your gear and cause the wearer to overheat and snag on twigs as you're moving through the underbrush? The juice has to be worth the squeeze, if you know what I mean. The second thing to keep in mind as we're evaluating this is, while something might help reduce your thermal signature, it also has to maintain your camouflage in the visible spectrum and the near-infrared. You can't compromise concealment in visual and near-infrared just to hide from thermal. So like if you wrap yourself in that reflective mylar blanket, you're doing more harm than good because everybody else can see you, including the thermal operator probably. Next, you have to consider what is the thermal camouflage actually doing for you? Is it going to completely conceal your thermal signature? Probably not. 
But if you can induce confusion or hesitation in the operator of the thermal, you've won. So you have to understand a little bit about psychology and pattern recognition, but you also have to understand a little bit about the sensor itself and the limitations. So let's explore how to exploit these. What is the anatomy of a successful thermal detection? So there's three things involved. Obviously, there is you hiding in the woods or wherever you happen to be. Then there is the thermal imaging device. So here's you, here's the thermal imager. And then there's the observer who is looking at you or trying to find you with the thermal. But there's more to it than that. You are hiding. You have a thermal camouflage. And that's what we're trying to evaluate here. And then there's the environment, the background. All together, this and this give you a thermal contrast. And that's what's being detected by the thermal imager and by the observer. These two guys are very important components to a successful thermal detection. The imager has to be powerful enough to detect that thermal contrast, and the observer has to be observant enough <laughs> to be able to recognize that pattern as you. We have no control over any of this. And we don't really have control over our background either, though we do have control over our movement and our placement. We can use the terrain to the best of our ability, to our advantage, but we're a little bit limited in that regard. Thermal camouflage is what we're going to be concerning ourselves with today. Now, before we talk about our detection evaluation criteria, there are a couple of concepts I want to explain about the sensor itself. This will be important for understanding something about the detection range. Our sensor measures the Difference in temperature, as we've been talking about already, delta T. And this will be a logarithmic scale, so you've got 0.1, 1, 10. It increases in order of magnitude at each step. And this axis will be our range from the observer, from the sensor, to the target. Now, as you increase that range, the apparent difference in temperature will go down. And that's linear on this log scale. This is the apparent delta T. But what does that mean? Well, the atmosphere has an effect on those uh, infrared light waves because it's constantly being absorbed and re-emitted and scattered by the atmosphere. So that's why, as you're increasing in range here, it is decreasing that apparent temperature difference between the object and its surroundings, making it more difficult for a sensor to detect. Each sensor, in addition to the atmospheric effects, has its limitations on detection range. And that is called the minimum resolvable temperature, MRT, of the sensor. And it usually follows a kind of S-curve like this in the logarithmic scale. This is MRT. And as you can see now, where they cross is your maximum detectable range. How do they define this minimum resolvable temperature? How do they evaluate these sensors? Well, it's a little bit tricky when you have an observer in the loop because that's subjective. So you may have seen 
when these bar patterns, they're repeating bar patterns when testing night vision devices or various optical observation devices. Um, and these repeating bar patterns are used in what's called the Johnson criteria or criterion. So the Johnson criterion basically states how many repeating bar patterns do you need in order to give it a 50% chance of detecting your object uh, at a given range. So these thermal guys took this idea and applied it for thermal thermal imagers, which you can do that. You can have um, repeating warm and cold bar patterns. Regardless, you don't need to know all of that, but in this paper here, uh, Methods for Evaluating Thermal Camouflage, this NATO paper, well, they're concerned with military procurement. And when it comes to military procurement, you need to have very objective specifications and methods for evaluating various options that is not going to be subjective and um, that could get you into legal trouble as a military procurement specialist. But we don't care about that. As civilians, we're just, we're just trying out some stuff and seeing qualitatively how it works. But I wanted you to understand this relationship between the, the inherent limitations of the sensor and the atmospheric effects. So let's talk about methods for evaluation. You could use detection range as your criteria. So keep your sensor constant and control for your thermal difference. And then get a bunch of observers to close the distance to your target. And the point at which they detect it is the detection range. Next, you could use the temperature difference. So control for your range, keep that constant, and measure the difference in temperature between your thermal camo and the surroundings, the environment. So this could look like this. You've got your delta T, and this is time. And you would want to measure it at multiple times a day because it's going to have a different effect. For example, <clears throat> this could be the temperature of your target, and this might be the temperature of the surroundings. And maybe there's a greater difference at a certain time of day when things are warmer, when the sun is shining on stuff. So you'll want to consider that. And lastly, there's the loosey-goosey controlled chaos, let's call it. And that is where we get crazy. Shoot, let's get crazy. Because the real test of a thermal camouflage's efficacy is real-world use. So get a buddy to be your op for, and you're gonna be hiding in the woods. Have your buddy find you. This is not scientific, but this is probably the most useful, especially for us. Put some imagination in the barn bag. Let's see what we can do today. For this first test, I wanted to compare a regular unmodified umbrella with a souped up umbrella. This arts and crafts project involved camouflaging the umbrella first with spray paint, using the finest Dollar General plastic flora to stencil in some foliage, then snip off the leaves of each bundle to be attached later. I also took some tan and green twine to make little tie-on attachment points that I can add camouflage to in the field. 
When all of these were attached around the umbrella, I went out and fetched some broom grass to add to the top. The last step was to cut out a couple layers of mylar to add to the underside, reflecting any emissions to the rear. The result was admittedly a little clunky, but ready for testing. From the left we have an unmodified umbrella, then our craft project in the center, and on the right is an emergency blanket. I placed hot hands under each one, and another off to the right as a control sample. This took place at around 9 p.m., a few hours after dusk. It's interesting that all three options appear colder than the surroundings, and the heat behind it gave it a sort of glowing, highlighted appearance. It definitely stands out, especially in the middle of the field. The other thing that was extremely evident was that I was not able to prone myself out in exactly in line with the sensor. And for that reason alone, this doesn't really seem like a practical solution. Especially since you don't know which direction the observer will be spying on you from. By the way, it was a very foggy night. You can see how little this affects the thermal visibility, and you can hardly see the temperature effects on the surroundings. So, some final thoughts. At the end of the day, I don't recommend adding an umbrella to your kit. Is it better than nothing? Maybe. But I can't imagine any operator popping up an umbrella during individual movements. I mean, have you ever seen that in footage coming out of Ukraine? I personally haven't. <laughs> it strikes me as much more practical to use tarps and mylar and environment foliage to cover your static position and rely on terrain features for concealment during maneuvers. See, I tried it at another time of day and it was so windy that it kept blowing over. Umbrellas aren't very good in the wind, especially when you're trying to hide behind them. This myth is busted as far as I'm concerned. This has been a lot of fun so far, and if you agree, consider dropping a like, commenting, or subscribing. With the success of some of my recent videos, I wanted to step up the quality in the future. I promise not to waste your time or spam you with any commercial content. And I also don't have any plans to monetize with ads. If you want to support me, I just created a Patreon, which 100% of the proceeds will go towards engineering stuff for my channel. I've got lots more videos planned, including a demonstration with the optic on the rifle, further videos about ghostnet comms with a cheaper setup, and a little bit about solar power while roughing it in the wilds. See you there!